وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين. Great answer. Okay, let's get into my personal, I would say, challenge in researching Islam. Excellent. Because when I read the Quran, for me it was so external to everything that I witnessed within my life. Mm. As I said, I had negative experiences with Muslims. I would have never expected the Quran to say what it says. I didn't expect the Quran to even speak about the worship of one God, believe it or not. That was the biggest surprise to me personally. Aside from that, once I started looking into the Quran, I found that Islam doesn't have only the Quran, but it has hadiths as well, right? Yes. Yes. And since the Quran is the word of God, and I know you heard this question a million times before, but nevertheless, sure, for me personally, it's still so strange that then I would need hadiths in order to complement it, right? And I heard Excellent. that you are into hadith sciences. Yes, or yes. You have a I, have a, I have a master's in hadith. And uh, perfect, these books perfect. that you see here, these are all hadith books. So perfect. we have a, the whole section here is on hadith, yes. So That's my basic question, question is, what is the importance of hadiths? That's basically Excellent. it. Excellent yeah. question. So when we see a verse from the Quran, um, we know many people today will want to misuse that verse. Right? Okay. And the verse will be explicit. For example, uh, you know, the, the verse about uh, it, to prepare the seeds of war against your enemy, but if they incline towards peace, then incline towards peace. Right? What Islamophobes do is they'll cut off the next verse or they'll cut out that context. And mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, uh, is the Khawarij or the extremists amongst the Muslims who do the same thing. <laughs> they will sure. take that verse out of context and the Islamophobes, the anti-Islam people will do the exact same thing. They, they kind of mm -hmm. come together on that uh, misuse <laughs> of the Quran. So what do they do? They'll take that verse out of context and then they will use it where it should not be. Right? Mm -hmm. So here, this is the beautiful thing about hadith. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about hadith first. I'll just tell you what's the point. It gives you that context. It gives you that reference so people don't misuse the words of Allah. So when mm -hmm. we say, mm -hmm. those that, uh, yani, we don't want to be on the path of those that earned the wrath of Allah or those that went astray, who are those? So if we don't right. have hadith, then everybody will come up with their own. Ibn Arabi, for example, he gave some strange meaning. You know, other people like that. Uh, they will give their own strange meanings. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, explained that Maghdubi alayhim is the Jews and Dalin are the Christians. So now we have a clear reference mm. to understand the context of the verse. Mm -hmm. Hadith also tell us about some verses that were during battle. And that's why I was telling you about some of the Sahaba, the companions. They said, yes, we were there when this, reveal, this verse was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it was during battle. So then that tells us you can't take that verse and put it in during peacetime, sometimes mm -hmm. or during travel. So hadith really gives us the context needed. The Quran tells us pray. That's, that's the order of Allah. Okay. But what are the minute details about the prayer? How am I going to fold my hand? How am I going to go into rukur? What verses am I going to recite? That is going to come in hadith. Mm -hmm. If all those rulings were in the Quran, now, and look, look, these are books of hadith, right? Imagine yeah. if the Quran had all this in it. Yeah. How would we memorize it? You know, how would we? Who's going to memorize? Exactly. Mm -hmm. so the Quran is the words of Allah. It's perfect. It's revealed. Hadith. There are weak hadith. You know, sometimes they're weak. That's why we have a whole, and I have a whole section in the library over there. And my particular passion is in the science of grading hadith and classifying mm -hmm. hadith. It's called Ilm al Rijal and Mustalal hadith. So unlike Christianity, where you're like, ah, we don't know who wrote it, but it's in the Bible now. No. For us, mm -hmm. if we don't know who narrated the hadith, it's called majhul. It's an unknown narrator. We can't accept it, right? So in hadith, we have books like Al-Bukhari and Muslim, who we know to be a compilation of authentic hadith. Then you have great works of hadith that have some weak hadith. And we reference to know which ones are weak and which ones are strong. And we don't rely upon weak or fabricated or unknown narrators kind of hadith. We only mm -hmm. accept that which is authentic. And it gives us that context needed to practice our daily life. Right. 
For me, my questioning is because I come from a Christian background, not trusting Paul necessarily, right? Of course. seeing him as somebody that innovated. I agree. When, when were the hadiths written down? How can I trust them? Excellent question. E um, even if they're, sorry, even if they're graded <clears throat> as Sahih, if they're graded as, okay, we accepted them, but when was that accepted? Excellent, what? excellent question. Um, the hadith were written down during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. There is clear references where he told Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, companion who was his cousin and all, yes. one of the earliest followers, to write down the rulings that have to do with accidental death and so on and send mm -hmm. it to a certain people. So that was written down as hadith, meaning his statement, during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. During the earlier time, the Prophet forbid writing down his words. Because the companions would be writing down, memorizing the Qur'an, and he didn't mm -hmm. want that his words are confused with the Qur'an. In the early times, they didn't know. Like if he said something, they may assume it's in the Qur'an. So he said, no, just write down the Qur'an. In the later times, he, the Prophet, peace be upon himself said, and there's a clear statement where he said, look, earlier I forbid you, now I allow you, because nothing comes from this mouth, meaning what he's been revealed except the truth. So in the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, hadith were written down. And then after that time, the companions like Abu Huraira and others, they memorized, like the mm -hmm. Quran was memorized. They realized when the Prophet used the Quran in prayer and told them that this is the Quran. So they had, by the consensus of the companions, 114 chapters, 30 juz of the Quran. So the other statements of Prophet, they also memorized and they wrote down and they had suhuf, they had these scrolls that some of these students of the first generation, this is talking about Sahaba, they had written down. Now, during the very early time, there is a book that I have it here. This is called the Mutta of Imam Malik. Imam Malik was very early on, in the first hundred years, he compiled an entire work, categorized, and each hadith, it takes the, and this is Arabic and English, but you see, it takes the chain all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that means in the first generation, we already had complete works. In the first hundred years, somebody from the first, uh, yani early times, between him and the Prophet, sometimes there's only two narrators, where he mm -hmm. will say, and Nafi'a said, Abdullah ibn Umar said, the Prophet said, right? So they had written down complete works. And every work of hadith that's an original work will give you the chain of narrators, unlike Paul, who never met Jesus. That chain right. is broken. Unlike only the, in a dream. Only in a dream. And we, like mm. in hadith, we don't rely on dreams. Mm. right? Unless you physically heard, saw uh, something, we don't accept it in hadith. right? So right. even if you look at the, the earliest biblical manuscripts that are written in 4th century, that means between that and even Paul's time, you have a huge gap of unknown people. Not in hadith. Um, let me show you a book here. This is Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, mm -hmm. The point I will make, if you look at the, the hadith, it's not just from Imam Bukhari. It will go all the way to the Abu Hur radiallahu anhu who said, I heard the Prophet, peace be upon him. So you mm -hmm. see, the chain is going to be all the way. So there is, there is no writing later. They were compiled maybe later, but the chain will go all the way to the Prophet. Meaning, who did they hear it from? Who did they hear it from? Who did they hear it from? All the way to the Prophet. If the chain is missing a link, that's a weak narration. We can't accept it. Right? So these were written down in the earliest generations. There were complete works that were put together like books in the first hundred years that we have. And even the later works will give you the chain all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, each person in that chain, we have their biography. I have an entire other section of the library that, that is Ilm al-Rijal. This is just the biographies of the narrators. So each person in that chain, I can pull his biography or her biography. When were they born? Where did they live? Wives, husband, children, what they did for work, how trustworthy were they? How good was their memory? And then we don't just rely on one chain. We have some ahadith that have 70 independent chains. So it's a very precise science. I mean, like I said, I have a master's in it. There's PhDs you can do in it. That mm -hmm. goes through a whole checking. So unlike in Christianity or other religious traditions where you kind of just go with like, well, that's what the church father said. Uh, it's right. not like that in Islam. 
So for somebody from the outside like myself, when Bukhari that you just showed, so I think his complete name is Muhammad Ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. He was a Persian, right? And he compiled yes. it yes. In, in 846 or something like that. That's right. Wikipedia. So, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. In, we go by Hijri date. So it's 200 something Hijri uh, after the time of the, of, the, of the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Yeah. Okay. When he compiles those hadiths, what does he have in front of him? Just for my understanding, I really... Excellent. Does, it, does he have so, text in front of him? Does he have people? Excellent. How does he compile them? Great, great question. So Imam Bukhari, he has teachers that have memorized, that teach him word by word, letter by letter. And they will tell him who did they memorize it from, who did they memorize it from, all the way back to the Prophet. Uh -huh. He also has actual books, because like I mentioned, the Muatta of Imam Malik is almost a hundred years about before Imam Bukhari. Mm -hmm. So these works are already written down, right? And even before the Muatta, you have the writings. There is a scholar named Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He's a very uh, strong and instrumental scholar. He's one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari, meaning Imam Bukhari reported a hadith from Imam Ahmad. Imam mm -hmm. Ahmad has a book called the Musnad Imam Ahmad. It's on the other side of the library, but it is actually bigger than Al-Bukhari. It's about 40,000 narrations. Mm -hmm. And that was already written down. So Imam Bukhari mm -hmm. has those written references in front of him. He also mm -hmm. has the verbal, the oral tradition in front of him that he memorizes. Imam Bukhari memorized around two to 300,000 ahadith, right? From memory. And from that, oh. he collected only about 2,700 something to be in his Sahih. So mm -hmm. before him, Scholars of hadith have already written books. You know, mm -hmm. this is the this is the lie that some people oh hadith weren't written until 200, 300 years later. That's just that's just a lie. Anybody mm -hmm. with academic honesty would know that Imam Malik, being in the first hundred years from Hijri, this is from the the way from the not even from the death of the Prophet peace be upon him and his teacher mm -hmm. Imam Zohri and the earlier Imma like uh, Imam uh, Abu Huraira who was a companion, his students had written down scrolls. Imam Ahmad. The teacher, Imam Bukhari, says in the Musnad that I saw this hadith written down in the handwritings of the students of the companion. Mm -hmm. Meaning even in his time, they had written records that they were able to verify reports with. Okay. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. This is pretty uh, impressive. Uh, the hadith scientists, like we don't have time to get into it in depth here, yeah, sure. are so accurate that I can tell you that if I was to take the scientific method of clinical trials, and the science of judging hadith, the science of judging hadith is more precise. Wow. Many Muslims are just ignorant about it. That's true. They use weak mm -hmm. hadith and things. That's just because they're ignorant. But if you spend the time to study it, and inshallah, after you become Muslim, I'll set up a special class for you uh, where <laughs> I'm going to go over these with you. You will realize that in hadith science, there is no doubt, right? It is such a precise science. We have this thing called mutawatir, and we have so many different ways of judging a hadith that it is amazing. It's beyond the scope of this conversation, but I have videos. I have sure. a, on our Majid Ribad channel, we have, a, a, I think it's seven or eight short introduction called the Science of Grading Hadith Made Easy. Once you go through that, you will be amazed. You will be amazed because in a clinical trial, that I, I work in you know, on pharma and med device, we don't mm -hmm. go through that much precaution like the scholars of hadith did. That's mm -hmm. how accurate it is. Um, and that's why in Islam we rely on it. Uh, but again, the Quran is the words of Allah. Quran, there is no mm -hmm. doubt. No hadith can be contradictory to Quran. When people say this hadith is contradictory to the Quran, it's just either they're ignorant of the, of the authenticity of the hadith or the application of the hadith, that's just their ignorance, you know, and that's why we have scholars who spend a lifetime studying these things and teaching these things. So that's amazing. You mentioned the contradictions to the Quran. My question would be when I was reading the Quran, the topic of four wives, for example, doesn't pop sure. up explicitly, right? And by the way, guys, I have no issues with four wives, I would like to have four <laughs> wives as well. But other than that, Allah bless it, you for it, God knows. It's a lot of work as well, though. Anyways, the way that I understood it is in the Quran, and correct me again if I'm wrong here, that... 
there is a verse in the Quran. Orphans, right? Like when somebody no, but, has to take but care of but there is orphans. a verse he says to marry two, three, or four. But if you cannot, then one, right? So mm. that ruling is in the Quran itself about uh, polygamy, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ also in a hadith mentioned it. But the Quran itself does give that uh, leeway, not just for orphans, even though it is sometimes definitely in the context of people that are in need, right? Mm -hmm. But even if you look in the earlier traditions, if you look at Solomon, if you look at David, if you look at the Old Testament, it's filled with polygamy. There's sure, nothing sure. Um, in the earlier religious traditions that stops it. In the Quran, there is a clear verse that tells you two, three, or four. And if you're unable to be just, then one is best. And that mm -hmm. is the natural state. You have Adam and Eve. You have one, one. Great. If you're happy with one wife, great. You're happy. She's happy. Live your life, right? But no doubt, Till today, there is a need. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, in Iraq recently, there was a war, as we mm. know, and many of the men were killed and many uh, women, unfortunately, the documentaries were forced into prostitution and things that they really shouldn't be because they had no way to make a living. There, right. there was no economy. There was no men were out there fighting each other, you know, with guns and whatever. Women couldn't. So we in Islam don't believe in that hypocrisy where you put a woman in that state. In, mm -hmm. in in the West, uh, and I mean in Europe, and you've lived in Europe and in other countries, what there is it is a hypocrisy, right? They will say, "Oh, polygamy! Oh, how could you?" <laughs> but if a man has thirty girlfriends, there's no there's no problem with them. And, no and which which president hadn't had mistresses? I mean, sure. if you talk about Donald Trump having sex with a porn star while his wife was pregnant, that somehow is legal. But if sure. he was to get a second wife, that would that would be like, oh no, you know, mm. Bill Clinton and actually marry her, actually marry her, right? Ooh, Openly bad. and the no <laughs> secret marriages. I mean, this is something right. that should be done open. Look, if, if Bill Clinton's in the Oval Office doing whatever with Lewinsky, he still stays the president. He doesn't even get mm. any right. But if he was to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to take a second wife. I want to be open about it. I don't want to do it hidden. Then, oh, that's that's horrible, right? All these yeah. massage parlors and strip clubs and dance clubs and what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas and all this stuff, all this mm. underhanded, hip hypocritical, all these church leaders that get found out in hotel rooms with prostitutes, that all goes on and we try to try to blind the eye to it. In Islam, mm -hmm. we don't believe in that. Look, if you're happy with your wife and she's happy with you, great, live your life. And that's 99% of the Muslim world. I mean, if you go to the Muslim world, you will hardly, in most Muslim countries, you will hardly see polygamy because that's it's just the way people live. But sure. if there is a situation that in a halal, in a clear way, in a permissible way, without trickery and all that, you can have a second wife, great. I mean, if, if they're all happy with it, well, why do we have a problem with it, right? Yeah, it makes sense. No, you see a lot of hypocrisy like that in the West, of course. Yeah. People being against, as I said, marrying women, right, and making right. them honest women. But as a woman or a man nowadays, you can be promiscuous as much as you want to be and yeah. swipe on Tinder left and right and have a good exactly. time, quote unquote. No exactly. worries, right? Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty, speaking about sexuality. This is something that I heard from David Wood himself, right? And mm -hmm. the first things that you hear from those Islamophobes or anti-Islamists, call them what you will, mm -hmm. is always violence, sexually charged comments, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So before I mention the sexually charged comments, I don't know what al Khan fi ulum al Quran is, right? That oh. is the source. I want to start like that first and foremost. What is that source? And then we can read out the comments if you want to. Yeah. Let me get it for you. I have it, actually. Awesome. Unlike David Wood, I actually have books. I don't <laughs> just Google them. He has the internet uh -huh. at his disposal. But he disappeared. He's not <clears throat> online anymore. Yeah. yeah. He's so gone. this is Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Qur'an, Imam <laughs> Siyuti, who is uh, from around the ninth, 900 Hijri, meaning okay. about 900 years after the Prophet, peace be upon him. Right. Um, and you can see I have studied this book quite extensively. This is a book dedicated to the sciences of how you explain the Qur'an. 
mm-hmm. and how you understand it. It's not a Quran uh, tafsir. It's not a it's hadith not book. It is not, not a tafsir. tafsir. Oh, okay. is, no, no. So, so this is this is this is why the problem with Islamophobes. They don't actually know what they're talking about. Mm. They Google things. They don't know Arabic. They don't know the text. Uh, David Wood doesn't know what this book is. If I showed this to him, he wouldn't know the what book it is. Yeah, sure. Let alone be able to read it, right? So this is a book that just goes over uh, the different scientists about the Quran. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even explain the Quran itself. It just tells oh, you wow. how explanation is done, how mm-hmm. the Quran was compiled, how the companions memorize the Quran, how, uh, you know, different sciences of the writing of the Quran, how the different lettering and the meanings and those things. It's, it's about the sciences, ulum of Quran. It's not mm-hmm. a Quran book. It's not a tafsir book. It's not a hadith book. It's not a fiqh mm-hmm. book. It's not Jewish book. None of that. When I heard this statement made at first, I thought, oh, that's in the Quran. All right. Yeah. Then I looked further into it. Then I thought, oh, okay, it's in the hadith. And now my latest research, I was like, oh, okay, that's a tafsir then. It must be an explanation, but it's not even that. It is not, yeah. And again, um, if we go through the different chapters, Yanni, it will talk about uh, the the difference between abrogation and abrogation. It will talk about the differences between uh, some of the different ways of recitation. Um, mm-hmm. it, this is a section about those companions that memorize the Quran by heart. Um, mm-hmm. I've got my own notes with it, obviously. But this is not a book we rely upon for tafsir itself. I have mm-hmm. a whole section that has tafsir ibn Kathir and Tabari and uh, Imam Asiyuti, the author of this book, also wrote a tafsir book. He wrote a mo- few tafsir uh, books. One is called Durr, uh, and he has another one, uh, Qutf al-Azhar, which is a two-volume, very rare one. I have it as well. And other books, uh, uh, Tafsir al-Mathur and so on. This is not one of them. So, go ahead. What's That's very book? interesting. So it has been written 900 years after the Prophet on top. Yeah? Yes, yes. And again, it's not a hadith book. It, it doesn't have any chain of narration for hadith. Um, it's just more giving. It even gives you sometimes contradictory opinions to explain to you how how those opinions are, are merged or understood, which one is stronger and so on. Okay. All right. The quote. Each time we sleep with a huri, we find her virgin. Besides, the penis of the elected never softens. The erection is eternal. The sensation that you feel each time you make love is utterly delicious and out of this world. And were you to experience it in this world, you would faint. Each chosen one, i.e. Muslim, will marry 70 Huris besides the woman he married on earth. And all will have appetizing vaginas. Okay, what's the reference in it's fun because I have it here with me. Uh, yeah, and, the, and the reference, the reference again, according to David Wood, was Al Iqtan Fi Al Quran, page 351. Okay, is it a volume or it just gives you a page? That's the only information I got. Hmm. So that's interesting. Um, 351, you said 351 is. So I have the whole Itqan here. It's the original is actually in three volumes. Um, mm-hmm. None of those volumes go past three hundred and twenty. Wow. Okay. So this volume, the Must first be the volume, special pages then. ends right. <laughs> this is the second volume that begins here, which goes to the end of it, which is two hundred and seventy-eight. It ends. It is the third volume, and it goes on to 279, and then okay. it ends. So, and then the last volume here ends at 242, first off, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a four-volume work. I have it printed in one volume. I none of those references would make any sense because you couldn't look it up in the actual book. I don't know where he Googled okay. it from. Mm-hmm. Secondly, that's not a verse in the Quran that I know of. If it's in the no. Quran, let them know. That's not a hadith 
explicitly by those words, I've never heard that hadith. If there is, I'd love to see it in a book of hadith so we can look at mm -hmm. the chain of narrations. If it's a statement of Imam al-Shiyuti himself, or if he's referencing somebody else, those are people's statements. Right? Mm -hmm. In the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, we don't find anything like this with those yeah. wording. Right? So this is really them. But but since we're on the subject of uh, sex and sexualization and things, I've got a Bible. I'm not talking about some Christian scholars writing 900 years after Jesus or some priests in some monastery with some boy. I don't mean all that. Let, let's leave all that aside. Let, let's take the Bible itself. Let's talk about Lot and him having drunken sex with his daughters. With Isn't his daughters, that man. in the that I, I'm not again. I would love to see David Wood come and bring me a verse from the Quran, and I believe in it, and I'll explain it. Or an authentic hadith from the Prophet from Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, and Nisai, Jami, Imam Ahmad. Uh, Al Bazar, any of these books of hadith, and give the chain, and we'll look at that because they're weak hadith as well. Mm. But from the Bible itself, you're talking about a, a man who's called a righteous man in the New Testament. So don't try to get out of, oh no, you know, yeah. having repeated, not one night, multiple nights, drunken sex with two different daughters. That's incest. Well, let's talk about David. I mean, if you talk about David, you know, he, in, in the in the Old Testament, you will see that he looked at a woman taking a bath. This is in the Bible, right? And we can give you references if you like. I mean, I, I can go get my Bible and show you right now. No, no, I know them. Right? Um, and, and he likes this woman, and he's called a prophet. Again, mm -hmm. they try to, oh, no, I've got a Bible verse. He's called a prophet. So David, who's in the New Testament called a prophet, he sees this woman, she's taking a bath. She's a married woman. Mm. And he brings her and he, whether by force or not, or, you know, he has sex with her. And her husband is a soldier in David's army. And this mm. is a prophet in the Bible. And then, not not just that, I'm not talking about virgins in heaven. And so this is a somebody's wife. You're committing adultery with, with your own soldier's wife until she gets pregnant. And then mm. when he figures out she's pregnant, he has Job send her husband back, who is a righteous, good soldier, and then he sends a letter with him to Job and say, hey, put him in the front lines so he can be killed because I got his wife pregnant. <laughs> David, come on, man. You want to talk about perversion and sexuality, let's get the Bible uh, and let's take a look. Don't go to Ulum al-Quran and a book that with a reference that you don't understand that's not in the Quran itself, the not in Sahih Hadith. Let's talk about the Bible. Right? So these things are just done in an Islamophobic manner. Mm. Most authentic hadith will never have explicit wordings like penis and vagina. These you just don't find because they're not. You will not find such wording in the Quran or Sahih hadith in those words. Right? Uh, right. You will have references to inter intercourse because obviously that's a part of human life. But it, it would. I have never found an authentic narration that mentions those wording. It's not in the Quran for sure. It's not in a book of hadith that I've seen. I have never, I've studied the book and I didn't come across such a quote, but if it is in there, it's going to be in reference to somebody's statement, not to uh, original text itself. All right on. Yeah, I didn't know that, as I said, for me. And first, when I heard it from David Wood, I thought, okay, this is in the Quran, done deal. Yeah. Right? This, this explains the 72 versions. And then now you're Which you is also not in the Quran, yeah. No, it's not in the Quran. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Uh, there is a hadith for it. And yeah. yani, when we talk about uh, the uh, different things in, in hadith and things, there is context mm. to understand what does it mean to be a martyr and so on. Um, mm. I mean, we do believe that there are spouses in paradise that are from the mm. women of paradise. Uh, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, also told us that the women of this world, the world will be your wives in paradise. So mm. if you are married, and, you know, like the Prophet, nobody is a single person in, 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 in paradise. So if you're a woman who was never married, you will be married in paradise. You will live a happy life. If you're married to a woman in this world, then you and her both make it to paradise and you want to live together. It can be you and her and you can live your life. But I mean, if you if you controlled your desires in this world, 
and uh, Allah blesses you with uh, beautiful women in paradise, and that's something Allah blesses you with. Uh, you know, as as the other beautiful things of paradise are a reward. Um, nothing wrong with that. Let's continue with the claims of Islamophobes, etc., because those are the things that are consistently in my subconscious while researching Islam. You know, it is what it is. The only time that I really put my bias aside was when I was reading the Quran itself, and it had a transformative effect on myself, right? Just by leaving the bias aside and just looking at it completely far, far away from what I saw in Germany or in Macedonia or whatnot. That was amazing. However, now further researching into it, I always get reminded of those claims, you know, be it David sure. Wood, be it whatever. Ask away. We'll clear those up before you're I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to line up the points the main right. points that they've made about Prophet Muhammad, and then Excellent. we can go through them point by go point. Go for it. Okay, so the claims are, again, allegedly, allegedly based on Buhari, Muslim, and Kitab al-Hudud. So the first one is that prostitution was allegedly legalized by Prophet Muhammad. The next okay. one is he got poisoned by a Jew Jewish woman, which husband he killed. Then he killed hundreds of people, including children, in Banu Koreja and mm. took the widowed women and girls as sex slaves. Then the next one has been discussed a billion times, Aisha's age. Mm. All right, Another so, so, one. Let, let's yeah. take them one by one. All right. Okay, let's take them one by one. Um, so first one, prostitution so, was allegedly legalized excellent. by Prophet Muhammad. That is, uh, and the reason he didn't bring that in front of me is because he knows that that's just a bold lie. There was a practice called muta, and this mm -hmm. is something the Shia, the Rafidah, yeah. still have, mm -hmm. which was a pre-Islamic practice, meaning ah. before Islam, this was a practice amongst the Arab, like drinking alcohol, like gambling, and right. it was forbidden in stages. There is a book in Sahih Muslim, which I have here, um, where in a hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that this is something that was halal, that was permissible before because the ruling had not come. But now mm -hmm. Allah has made it haram till the day of judgment, oh. meaning it was forbidden. Now, many evils were there in, in Arab society, burying of, of daughters, right? And yeah. these things were forbidden by Islam, but in stages. Now, mm -hmm. imagine if all the rulings, Aisha radiyanha, she has a beautiful hadith, that if all the rulings came at one time, people wouldn't be able to handle it. People right. used to drink, they used to gamble, they used to do all kinds, they used to have prostitution. Uh, women would have multiple men that would come visit and they would just pick mm. one, this is the father, you know, all yeah. this kind of stuff. I read if, that. One, if one day they said all of that's gone, people, human nature, they can't handle. It's like taking a kid uh, into kindergarten and telling him, here's here's a book on physics and, uh, you know, it's calculus and uh, mm. no, you can't handle it. So. Everything, even the stopping of drinking alcohol was in stages. There was a mm -hmm. stage you just couldn't pray when you're drunk. There's a stage where you should better stay away with it. Stage, completely forbidden, right? right. So like that, in stages, the practice of muta was made haram. First, it was mm -hmm. only in certain situations. Then it was allowed only during battles because the people couldn't handle it. And then as the final ruling, as the ruling of Islam today, is muta was made haram till the day of judgment. That's in Sahih Muslim. The hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, so, no, that claim is just totally false. That practice was there pre-Islam. Islam and the Prophet, peace be upon him, mm. forbid it. We as Muslims wow. today do not believe in prostitution. We don't believe in muta. Ah. We don't believe in this. We have nikah, which is the marriage, the zawaj. And that's the only way for sexual intercourse is the proper Islamic halal way. That's one. Oh, that's ahead, a next. very, very interesting explanation man because i talked to shias and they still practice it apparently where they yeah. marry a woman and then divorce her afterwards yeah so the muta doesn't actually have a um, marriage they have a they have a time contract and oh, wow. unfortunately this is something that they practice but this is wrong and uh, it's in sahih muslim in the quran even when allah revealed the, the the verses about marriage and being the way this means that those pre-islamic practices were forbidden if the Shia practice it, this is their mistake. But mm -hmm. the vast majority of the Muslims around the world, you will see, will clearly know based on the authentic Sahih Hadith that this is something Allah made haram till the Day of Judgment. 
Right on. Let's continue. He got poisoned by a Jewish woman, which husband he killed. I was reacting okay. to a video just recently, and there, mm. I don't know exactly who it was, Zucker Naik, I believe. And mm. he said that Mohammed died a natural death. And for me, that was he a did. surprise, because I only heard that he got poisoned by that Jewish woman from David Wood. No, he... He, the, uh, I have a series on the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, among authentic sources, and we talk about the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He mm. did not die as a direct result of the poisoning, even mm. though he felt the pain of some of that poisoning, even at the time of death. But uh, regarding the woman herself, it, this was not something that caused the death directly, meaning it was not mm. like he got poisoned and then he died from it. But the poison had an effect, and he felt some of the pains of it. And there's a great wisdom in that. His, his death was a natural death, meaning that Allah had written for him and he died at that time. He was not killed. He was not stabbed. He was not shot. You know, that kind of thing. But Allah gave him the status of a martyr, even though it, Allah didn't allow that somebody in battle would take down his prophet. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but he was given that status. By having that, he was poisoned earlier and he felt some of that pain from it so that he is given the status of a martyr without being killed in battle. If he was killed in battle, then people are like, oh, what kind of a prophet gets killed? Even though we know prophets are humans, humans die. But but this is the wisdom of Allah and there's a deep wisdom in that. But his death was not directly due to the poisoning. That is incorrect. And uh, her husband being killed for the poisoning is incorrect. That's an incorrect reference. Regarding, this will take us into Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir and Banu Qaynuqa and the, what happened at Khaybar. Um, and by the way, if you look up the One Message Foundation channel, I had a debate when I caught David Wood's ignorance in this, where he mm -hmm. didn't even realize that Khaybar was, was close to Medina. And mm -hmm. He didn't realize what happened. He thought as if the Prophet peace be upon him went into Khaybar and just massacred Jews. This is historically incorrect. And I mean, I have references that I marked to show him, but he, he ran away and never came back. And now the channel is gone. So I won't be able to show him. But I mean, if you like, I can bring them here, but I can just tell you about it. You can just tell me it's fine. The Battle of Khandak was a battle mm -hmm. when, the, when the Arab tribes from outside of Medina attacked Medina. There was okay. a contract amongst the people of Medina mm -hmm. that we will defend Medina together. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jewish, whether you're an idol worshiper, whatever you are, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. There was a peace treaty that we will not, if the Jews are attacked from outside, the Muslims would, would defend them. It was, a, it was to say that we are together as a community in Medina to protect Medina. And this okay. was a contract made. When the Battle of Khandak happened and the different Arab tribes attacked Medina, the Jews of Banu Quraida, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, these are three tribes, they betrayed that treaty. This is not mm -hmm. all Jews. This is a particular tribe that were a part of that treaty. Not only did they help the enemies, they sent them weapons, they sent them soldiers, and on top of that, they tried to attack the Muslim women and children during the battle because the men had gone out to dig a trench, that's why it's called Khandak, Mm -hmm. So that people don't get, and Muslims and Jews were all protected by the Muslims there. But these Jews even tried to attack the Muslims. And this is, I have a book here. Uh, I mean, I can show you some of the books on Sira that I had marked up to show, just so he understands. But because he's just Googling, he's not looking up actual books. Even the references he does, he gets from online sources and websites, which have a lot of mistakes. That's why we tried to use books. So, here, now, when the battle finished, and the Muslims realized that, a part, that the treason had taken place, then yes, those people that were involved in trying to attack Muslims and help the, the enemies, and they betrayed the treaty, they were killed as part of treason. That was part of the that deal. Makes sense. That makes sense. Women and children were not killed. This mm -hmm. is a lie. Women and children were not killed. Even some of the children that were involved in the fighting were left alive when they, because they were children. Some of them that were a little bit older where they could make their decisions, yes, they were because they were a part of the, the force that was used in that treason and that attack on the Muslims during the Battle of Khandak. This is what happened. Now, other Jews in other parts of Arabia that still had treaties with Muslims, even after the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, there were Jews that used to come in and interact with Muslims. 
This is a particular situation, a situation of war, where there was a treaty and there was a treason made, and those that did the treason were put to death, as was the contract between the Muslims and, and the people of Medina at the time. Fair enough. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. Aisha's age. Age of Aisha. Excellent. I have a, a longer video on this, so you can watch that for more details, but I'll give a brief answer. Regarding the age of Aisha radiyanha, there is nothing in the Quran about it. There's no verse in the Quran that discusses her age. There's nothing from the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he mentioned her age. There's no hadith we call marfu' yani where the Prophet, peace be upon him, said about her age. We do have narrations from her, and we have some in Bukhari, and we have some in Muslim. And there are some uh, discrepancies between those narrations. And not okay, Again, like I want to be very clear. I'm not denying those narrations because they are authentic. But what does that mean? That the chain of narrators do go back to her and she made certain statements. Um, well, the one in Sahih Muslim, for example, uh, it mentions that she was seven at the age of uh, engagement, where the, where the engagement took place. And she was nine at the time of the actual consummation of marriage. Uh, the one in Bukhari, one of them, and another one in Sahih Muslim mentioned six and nine and so on. So, and these are authentic narrations. Uh, Imam Muslim he has Sahih Muslim. The most famous explanation is called a uh, Sharh of Sahih Muslim by Imam Al Nabawi. Imam Al Nabawi, a later scholar, mm -hmm. but still a very classic scholar. He discusses the differences, why different ages were given, and so on. So, this is not something we're rewriting history with or something. Rather, what we do know is that ages were not well kept at that time because there was no calendar. Like imagine if I asked her age, but there was no date. There was no 1990, 1980, 2000, none of that, right? Basically, the Arabs would go by the events of a year, like the year of the elephant, where the elephants attacked Mecca or so on. Right. When they would have certain events, they would kind of remember dates from that. That's why many of the companions, even Khatija, the first wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have different opinions about her age at the time of marriage, ranging from 25 and 28, which is more authentic, to all the way mm -hmm. to 40. 40, right? Big range. Yeah. The, the narration for 40 is actually a weak narration, but you find mm -hmm. it in most of the history books. But the point being, until the Hijri calendar began in the time of Umar, meaning after mm -hmm. the, the death of the Prophet, Sallam, after the death of Abu Bakr, and the time of Umar, the first Muslim calendar developed, the Hijri, which we still use today. Mm -hmm. So, how would she really know her age? Why did she give two different ages? Probably because. This was an estimate based on what people told her. It doesn't mean that she's a weak narrator. She's a very strong narrator of hadith. She's amazing. But obviously, she wasn't present-minded at her own birth, right? Meaning, if you ask me my age, I'm going to ask somebody like my mom or check my passport or my birth certificate. Well, if you don't have a passport or a birth certificate, not even a year numbering system, and basically, you're going to rely upon other people, older sister. Uh, hey, you know, when was I born? Well, I think you were born around this eight years. You're about this age. It's going to be a, an approximate. And there are On some notes. Even my father's generation, he doesn't exactly know when he was born. It's an estimate exactly. as well. And that's just one generation back in Macedonia. Exactly. I mean, even if you look at a lot of the Somali uh, citizens that we have in America today, all right. of their birth dates are January 1st. <laughs> I don't know what happened nine months before January 1st, but somehow they're because they didn't in Somalia, they didn't really care. It just didn't really matter to them. And when they came here, they just kind of put that as their birth date. So the point being, uh, that's not really something in the Quran or it's not a part of the Islamic belief, aqidah, as we say. Uh, it's not something the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us. So this whole big deal that has been made is just trying to distract. What we do know of authentic hadith, that she was already engaged at that time. So that mm -hmm. means in the Arabian society, whatever age she exactly was, it was the age that girls would usually get engaged and they would wait till they were physically capable of uh, bearing children, which you know usually would be indicated through haid, which is the menstrual cycle, which is the natural way of letting you know a woman is ready. Um, mm -hmm. And then they would go ahead and consummate the marriage. So that was society of that time. And that was correct. And none of the pagans, none of the enemies of Islam ever objected to that marriage as unusual for that society. So now, 
let's talk about recent time. My grandmother was married at 14. You know, mm-hmm. my other grandmother from other side was married at 12, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is just, like I said, and like you said, it's very recent. Mm-hmm. Now, today in America, we would find that unacceptable, right? Mm-hmm. But it is incorrect for us to judge history by our standards, right? Because Absolutely. today, why do we not have girls get married at 14 and 15, for example, is because yeah. they got to finish high school and they want to go mm-hmm. to college. Yeah, that's true. But in a society where you don't have high school, you don't have middle school, you don't have elementary school, you don't have uh, colleges, you don't have universities. Once a boy is physically capable, he gets married. Once yes. a girl is physically naturally indicative that she can produce children, she gets married. That's yes. how that society runs. So the marriage of Aisha was at an age that was perfectly acceptable for the society of that time. Whether she was nine at the time when they actually consummated or older, as her older sister, some of the narrations mention, doesn't really matter. What Mm. matters is that she was of the right age for marriage for that society. We have in America, many presidents that got married to girls that were under age, according to our standard of 18 today. We have uh, Elvis Presley, Presley. a younger girl. You have, I mean, if you go to Europe, all your kings, right? And since we're on the subject, you know, how old was Rebecca, according to biblical references, when she got married in the Bible? Three. Right? So mm-hmm. I'm just saying that if, if David Wood or any of the Islamophobes want to be just and honest about it, well, according to majority <laughs> of the biblical scholars, Mary was about 12 when she got married. They might come back, oh, no, no, no. Mary's age is not in the Bible. Well, Aisha's age is not in the Quran. Right. Right? Fair enough. But yes. if you go to any historical references like the Catholic uh, encyclopedia and others, they will mention that she was around 12 to 14 years of age. And Joseph, according to those references, was around 90 at mm. the time. And, yeah. you know, they had sexual intercourse afterwards, uh, as most references will mention. And, you know, she was married to him at that age. Now, today, that would not be acceptable. But then people say, oh, no, 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 at that society, that's when Jewish girls would get married. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, then Arabian society, that's when Arabian girls would get married. Right, right. Yeah, I just want to point out the hypocrisy again here in the West. If you look into what teenagers do, everybody knows it. It's an open book. When they hit right. puberty, they go out partying, they have promiscuous sex, right. teen pregnancy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is nature. This is God showing you that the bodies are fully functioning. Yeah. And instead of using it productively, like your grandparents in that case, they use it absolutely in the wrong way. And end up, yeah, never married, single mom, households, whatever, right? There's so a, there's a school in San Diego. Uh, I used to be a teacher's assistant when I was going to college in that school. Mm. And they have a daycare for the girls, and it's a middle school, right? Okay. That means sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was a 12-year-old girl uh, that had a child yeah. in that school. Now, imagine that means she was sexually active at 11 or under, right? Yeah. And nobody considers that to be an uh, illegal act here in America today, right? Mm-hmm. She did it. She's not in yep. jail. Her boyfriend that she had the child with is not in jail, right? Right. If that is okay for people to have sex at that age, then why wouldn't they get married at that age? If they're ready for it, right? Absolutely. In Islam, we have books of fiqh jurisprudence. And what those books like al mughni and Majmu'ah, they tell us, is marriage has to do with physical readiness and mental capability of a person. Meaning mm-hmm. if you're in a society where through menstrual cycles or whatever else, you are ready. And that's not the only thing. There are other indicators that can be taken for sexual intercourse. And you want to get married at that age. We cannot say, no, you cannot. Right? Because if you don't, have, like some societies, the average lifespan is around 30 years of age. Mm-hmm. And even till today, it's interestingly, uh, and if that is true, and you tell somebody you have to wait to be 21 to get married, you know, have to study first. Like, Who, who's going <laughs> to raise the kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to, like, by the time you're 10, your parents are dead, um, right. right? And in yeah. earlier societies, you had certain things like that as well. Sure. So, um, you know, in accordance with society of that sign, and this is why none of the polytheists, none of the Jews or Christians or 
atheist or anybody else in that society ever objected to that marriage because that was mm -hmm. the norm of society. Makes sense. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This concerns the prophethood itself or the revelation itself. It's a two-part question. So Angel Gabriel never revealed himself as Gabriel, according to my knowledge. And his wife told him that he is the prophet to Muhammad, even though Muhammad was scared of his experience. So, for example, in the Bible, from what we've seen is that the angel Gabriel actually introduces himself to Mary, but it's not the same interface, not the same respondents sure. with Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. So, so that's actually incorrect. Uh, the angel okay. Gabriel did uh, introduce himself as the angel, um, not once, but repeatedly. And you will find in the Quran uh, references to when uh, the angel Gabriel showed his actual form to the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at the first incident, he was in shock, as, as anybody else would be, um, you know, having given that huge responsibility at the age of 40. So when he went to his wife, she comforted him, and she told him that you are an honest man, and Allah would not allow somebody as good as you, who is uh, somebody who keeps the trust, who's always been honest, never lied, to be misguided. She comforted him. But the angel Gabriel came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in many forms, repeatedly through his life, introducing himself. So this is one of those Islamophobic lies, because mm -hmm. even in a hadith in Al-Bukhari, he came and the companions saw him. And he came uh, at that time in the form of a man. And he sat with the Prophet, and he asked him questions. The Prophet told the companion, this is the angel Gabriel. And many times in authentic narrations, he came and he asked permission to enter the house. And he mm -hmm. came and saw him. And sometimes in his actual form, which covers the sky, sometimes in a, a in angelic form, but less than that, and sometimes mm -hmm. in human form, when the companions even saw that he was somebody that had no traces of travel, and he had very clean clothes, and he was not from Medina, so they were shocked. And the mm -hmm. Prophet told him, this is Jibreel, and he's come to teach you the religion by asking questions. It's a very famous hadith, authentic hadith in Al-Bukhari. Uh, where the five pillars of uh, of Islam and six pillars of Iman are mentioned in that hadith and so on. So so though he, he definitely did introduce himself repeatedly, and there is no doubt to that prophethood. Very good to know. This is something that I didn't know. I learned something. So after this questioning, we are pretty much through with those questions. I just want to hear it from you as a sheikh, how you would describe Prophet Muhammad, his character, his actions. He's been called the Excellent. perfect example. How would you describe him? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was human. We don't worship him. We don't consider him to be God. Uh, but no doubt in my mind at all that amongst humanity, he was the best of them. Um, other prophets were also excellent. We don't, we, don't, we don't try to put down any prophet. Jesus was an amazing person. Moses was an amazing person. Abraham was an amazing person. Peace and blessings be on all of them. That's one thing beautiful about Islam. We love all the prophets. We love, we respect all of them. Uh, we take all of them to be equally a part of our belief. Meaning if I deny as a Muslim, David or Moses or Jesus or Abraham, peace and blessings be upon them, I'm no longer a Muslim. That's a part of our belief. Right? The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived in a time where he showed us everything. Meaning uh, like Jesus, for example, he was never in a time where he had to lead a state or he had to defend uh, against a war, or get married and deal with children, right? His lifespan, uh, uh, and again, as Muslims, we don't believe that he's finished, that he's, he's not dead, he was raised to Allah, and he will come back. But his life in this worldly life, as, as was here until he was taken up to Allah, was very short. So we don't see a lot of these things, right? But the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 63 years was, was his life when he passed away from this worldly life. So that tells you that all of those states were known. And if we look at, and again, like I said, I have a series on the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It's on the One Message Foundation channel, and it's also on the Mizribad channel. Mm -hmm. We have the beginning all talking about him as a person and what is authentic, Sahih Hadith. Anas ibn Malik, one of the young companions who was there as a servant, not a slave, but he was there to serve the Prophet, peace be upon him. He said, I served him and he never got upset. He never told me, oof, even, which is the lightest 
word of displeasure. He never told me, why didn't you do this? Why did you do this? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never hit a wife. He never hit his children. He was such a beautiful character. I mean, in a, in a, there's a hadith where he, playing with his wife Aisha, he pokes her chest a little bit. And they're like, oh, he abused his wife. Aisha Radian herself says the Prophet never hit. And this is his companionship. His, he used to joke with his wives. He used to race with them. And, and they would win the race sometimes and he would win because he would have that loving relationship. He had an example of tolerance that I cannot imagine. You know, people slandered him. People hit him with rocks. Blood would flow from his head and fill his shoes. And he had the ability that he could destroy those people, but he forgave them, the people of Taif. In Mecca, when he was victorious, when Allah gave him victory in Mecca, he didn't say, you, I remember you said bad to me, I'm going to kill you. No, other than people that had committed war crimes and things, he came in with being humble, his beard touching his camel, he was, he was lowered that much, and he came in a way of forgiveness. He said, whoever goes in this house, they're forgiven. Whoever goes to the Kaaba, he's forgiven. Whoever goes here, they're forgiven. Like, like imagine that. Somebody kicks you out of your house, uh, kills your companions, causes the death of your wife through the hardship that Khatija went through, caused the death of Abu Talib, your uncle, to the hardships, killed your mm -hmm. uncle Hamza, and you forgive them. Look at that beautiful example. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he showed us how to be a leader of a state. He showed us how to lead a war, how to defend a people. Uh, he showed us all those things because those are things we go through. Humans have wars. Uh, in, if we yeah. say, okay, you know, this is the, Islam doesn't believe in hypocrisy, right? Mm. Christians will say, we turn the other cheek. But you know that's hypocrisy. I, I challenge any Christian, come to me, let me slap you a good bam. Let me hit you hard. And let me see you turn the other cheek. Right? So it's hypocrisy. You're saying something you don't do. Turn the other cheek. Why does every Christian country have an army? Why do yeah. we have police? Why do we have uh, U.S. invading Iraq? Why do we have the, the, why did we have crusades? Why did we have crusaders with swords and, and spears? And, and, and where is the pacifism? This is it's mm. hypocrisy, right? In Islam, we don't believe in hypocrisy. Yes, there's the time to defend you. You don't do dhulam. You don't do oppression. You don't, we don't believe in terrorism. We don't believe in killing innocent people. But there is a time. If you're going to kill me, I'm going to defend myself. That's a true Fair religion. Yeah. Yes. So I see the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to be a perfect example in all those situations, right? Uh, it's not a, his life is better documented than any other historical figure. Everything from what he ate and how he slept and what he did when he first woke up and may Allah reward Aisha radi anha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that she is the one that really, uh, one of the greatest narrators of hadith, because of her, we know a lot of those personal details, everything about him. And with that scrutiny to have that great character that Michael Hart, a non-Muslim who wrote 100 most influential people in the world, put him as number one shows you what a great, amazing person he was. Peace and blessings be upon him. Beautiful. My personal question about this is, because he is seen by yourself as well as this perfect role model, as Muslims, should you or shouldn't you distinguish between the prophets? Should there be an exalted position for Muhammad? Like when you become a Muslim, do you see Muhammad as higher slightly or are they all the same prophets of God? So, so there is three aspects to that one is our belief we believe mm -hmm. in all of them equally meaning that a part of the islamic belief is to believe in all of the prophets we can't reject any of them mm -hmm. okay? second is a love and respect we have for all of them meaning the prophet peace himself said don't praise me over you uh eunice like don't say oh he's better than eunice and another right. hadith he said don't praise me over musa so don't mm -hmm. compare between prophets say this one is better and this one. We don't do that. But we and do don't know that do, he is... So, sorry to interrupt. And don't do okay. what the Christians have done to Jesus, right? Exactly. Don't over-exaggerate mm -hmm. my status mm -hmm. or start praying to me or through me and all this stuff that right. some Muslims do do, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we do know that he was the Sayyid of Ibn Adam. Yani he is the leader of all of the children of Adam on the Day of Judgment. He is the one that will do the intercession for all of mankind. 
And we know he's the last of all prophets. So he has that status. We don't deny that status, that he mm -hmm. is the one that led all of the prophets in prayer, for example. Right. But we don't sit around saying, oh, he's better than this prophet. We, we don't do that. Right. We okay. love him and we love all the prophets. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. Beautiful. Okay. Next short burst question. This is of extremely big interest to me personally because I do love dogs. I do love drawing pictures as well. So why are those <laughs> things har haram? We have music. Excellent question. We have dogs, we have chess, even pictures and drawing sure. animated beings. And I love chess too. That's tricky. Will... Uh, آمنت أن الآخرة لا بد يوما آتية كل الخلائق حاضرة كل السرائر بادية